In terms of the ethnic composition, the, the demography of, of Newfoundland and Labrador, um, there are indigenous groups in, in the province. Uh, there are the Innu and Inuit in Labrador, what today we call Labrador, uh, the Mi'kmaq in the southeast of the island. Uh, sadly, and as I've mentioned before, the, the Beothic are no longer with us. In terms of European uh, presence, the two major groups that came there were the English from the West Country and the Irish from the south of Ireland. Uh, the English were English Protestants, the Irish were Irish Catholics. There were very few Irish Protestants in the population of Newfoundland. There was a small French presence on the south coast and later on, on the west coast. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, a few people from uh, Wales, uh, some Scots that came over from uh, Nova Scotia, but primarily, you've, and especially in this big fishery, you've got the, the, the West Country fishermen and you've got the Irish fishermen. What would happen is these ships that came over would stop in, in Ireland for uh, fishing servants. And so they were sort of, the Irish were, you know, sort of, further down, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the hierarchy, but really English servants were no, no better off either. Uh, so you've got a, a very sort of uh, uncomplicated, I suppose, in some respects, class structure. You've got, you know, you've got eventually governors uh, and, and politicians, and you've got merchants, and then you've got tradespeople and whatnot, and then you've got fishing, fishing servants and fishing families. Um, in terms of Ethnic uh, tensions, the, you know, obviously England and Ireland were not on the best of terms in, in much of the, uh, the period that, 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 you know, we're looking at in terms of settlement and, and the fishery. Uh, some of those tensions did come across uh, the, the ocean, but ethnicity is not just this, you know, something that you pack up in your trunk when you're an immigrant and you unpack it when you get there and you set up shop again. I mean, obviously, it's, it's something, it's, it's a way that you uh, negotiate difference with other groups and how you understand your own identity vis-a-vis -vis other groups. And sometimes that will change in new contexts. Uh, it often does. Sometimes it's sort of, you know, the whole idea of this ethnic identity will go away altogether. So it's not that sort of thing that just neatly travels. Uh, in Newfoundland, because there was so much interdependence in that fishery, you, you know, you had to get along with people. So you, you couldn't, you know, sort of bring all that political baggage from the home country to Newfoundland. You had to. But, you know, it doesn't mean that there weren't stirrings and there were, you know, dust-ups and whatnot. But for the most part, people got along. Uh, there was even, you know, a good deal of intermarriage in the early days. In the area that I researched, which is the Southern Avalon, uh, the English were there first, the Irish came out, and the, the English were incorporated into this Irish Catholic group through, through intermarriage and conversion, uh, to the extent that, you know, uh, after several generations, those who were of mixed descent didn't realize that they had English ancestors. So that's, that's how extensively they were brought in. But you do still see a demographic uh, pattern there and an ethnic uh, pattern and in the Southern Avalon, very Irish. St. John's, um, predominantly Irish, uh, you know, until later in the 19th century. Uh, in Conception Bay, which is the next bay up from St. John's, sort of just to the northwest, uh, that had a mixed population. And then in the northeast coast, uh, you had English. English Protestants. So, I mean, that does tell you, I think, a little bit about how people sort of placed themselves and situated themselves. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the Irish, and, and I have more expertise about the Irish, I can say that, you know, early British officials didn't help matters mo very much. You know, the governors were always sending off all these proclamations and orders uh, saying that the Irish had to be brought back from the island. Don't dare leave any of them on the island after the fishing season is over. Uh, you know, that they're treacherous, that they're going to join forces with our enemies at any point in time. And of course, the French were on the island for the, a while and the Americans then after they had their revolution, they, you know, they were prowling around. And so the British authorities were always, always very 
nervous. And again, that sort of comes from the relationship between in, you know, British authorities and Irish Catholics in Ireland, that sense that they're going to be subversive and they're going to take their chance. Uh, for the most part, though, a lot of what you see is more so class tensions than ethnic tensions, uh, especially um, you know, between the, the, the higher ups and, and, and the uh, fishing population. Um, Irish women themselves were not allowed, for a period, uh, one of the governors said that they weren't allowed to come to Newfoundland at all. Uh, 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 boat owners would be fined for bringing Irish women out. And so that's, that's kind of interesting too. You look at that kind of decision and you say, well, what made them so special? They couldn't even come in the summertime, according to this person. And so you know that, again, there's this, oh, we don't want that Irish ethnic group to sort of get settled here. And if you bring women out, they're going to have children, and then they're going to be here. Uh, there was much, you know, oh, they'll be, you know, a, a drain on, on the colony, well, not the colony, but the, the, the system. Uh, but many of these women were coming out because of the fishery. They weren't, uh, you know, they weren't going to be a drain on, on communities. Uh, they were hired as fishing servants. They, they, they were part of, you know, servicing the larger industry as, as seamstresses and laundresses and in the hospitality trade. And, uh, you know, so they, they, they provided a lot. And many of them became mistresses of uh, fishing households. So that doesn't quite, you know, so you can see that suspicion and that tension is still there. Um, as time moves forward, I think, we see uh, a growing uh, Irish middle class that's very ambitious. Then uh, this is coming into the 19th century, and they're they're wanting to um, you know position themselves vis-a-vis -vis and and uh, uh, what they see as a, an English Protestant oligarchy is the way they would describe it. Uh, you certainly have a couple of bishops. Uh, Catholic bishops who were very, very political and trying to move things along so that the Irish middle class can take the proper place. And also, of course, this is part of the Irish Catholic Church's civilizing mission around the world. I mean, they, they want to carve out space for themselves. So these two bishops, a Bishop Fleming and a Bishop Mullock, are face and eyes into the politics in Newfoundland. Uh, and, and you do have a you know, predominantly English Protestant hegemonic group. Let's face it, you know, they, they, and that just comes from generations of privilege. So that power is there. Uh, so they're dusting things up. But in terms of people on the ground and actual fishers, I mean, I think we need to think carefully about it. Uh, there's a tendency to see them as, uh, you know, being under the thumb of their elites. And, oh, you know, whatever this bishop told them, they went off and did that. and. Uh, that's that's not entirely true. I mean, I, I realize that there's a you know that some of this is feeding up and down. I think in a sort of circular form. But I also really believe in people's ability to uh, look out for their own self-interest. And if there's not something, some reason for them to get out and and have a riot, then they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it just because the bishop told them. So that kind of thinking about ethnicity, I think, is is. A, a little too superficial, maybe, for my liking. So I like to dig in and see what, in this particular context, might have caused, you know, this kind of tension to happen. And I suspect, you know, that there are different mixtures in all sorts of situations. Yeah.